I, I would vet potential partners a lot closer. Um, you, you know, we've, you know, I will say we've had a lot of, you know, I'll call them tire kickers where, you know, these, these, these companies come to us and they want to vet us to see if there's, you know, a potential partnership or working arrangement. And, you know, one of the problem is, you know, as a startup, um, a founder in a startup, um, you have to have your eye on the, uh, you know, over the next six months, where we want to go, what we need to do. And, and I think it helps, it helps to vet any type of uh, partnerships or any type of uh, working relationships a little bit tougher from the get go, mm. because it could, it could turn into a time suck. Hey everyone, this is Devin Miller here with another episode of The Inventive Founder. I'm your host, Devin Miller, the serial entrepreneur that's grown several startups into seven and eight figure businesses, as well as the founder and CEO of Miller IP Law, where he helps startups and small businesses with their patents and trademarks. If you ever need help with yours, just go to strategymeeting.com, grab some time with us to chat, and we're always here to help. Now, today we've got another great guest on the podcast, Craig Rupp. And uh, Craig uh, grew up on uh, on a farm and uh, had an agricultural background. Um, uh, and then after that, uh, he ended up going off working for uh, John Deere and doing agricultural technology. Felt that there was a lack of technology within the industry and wondered uh, about the different areas of agricultural and where it was headed. And uh, started also wondering about the labor situation and uh, how technology would in impact that. So started off so uh, solving small problems and then went out on his own and uh, started em employing those systems, got funding, started hiring people and has founded and grown the business from there. So with that much as an introduction, welcome on the podcast, Craig. Um, well, thank you, Devin. And it's great to be here. I hey, I'm excited to have you on and excited for a, a great discussion. So so I just kind of took the uh, the founding journey and condensed it in the 30 second version. So let's go uh, rewind and unpack that a bit, but kind of walk us through because I think, uh, you know, you started up kind of growing up on a farm in the agricultural business or background in that and that kind of to a degree, set you on the path for where you're at today, but kind of walk us through how you went about uh, founding the business and kind of identifying, uh, you know, the, the niche in the market. Okay, so uh, I did grow up on a farm. Um, I'll be honest with you, I thought I was cursed growing up on a farm um, just because, you know, chores were, uh, you know, an ordinary thing growing up on a farm. And, uh, you know, when I graduated high school, I wanted to, you know, I, I never wanted to set foot on a, on, on a farm again. And so I went and became an electrical engineer. And, uh, you know, I... I can't explain it, but, um, you know, growing up on a farm and having an agriculture background, there's this, uh, there's this power that keeps pulling you back into that industry. It's just because you have knowledge of it and you have experience of it, um, with it. And, um, uh, and it all started when, uh, you know, I took a job with John Deere and they were enamored because here I am an RF engineer. Uh, I'm a wireless guy, but I happen to have grown up on a farm and I understand, you know, the tractors and, and, and the, I guess the field operations and the agronomy to a given degree. So I can talk and talk, uh, talk the talk and walk the walk, you know, with farmers and whatnot. So I kept getting pulled back into agriculture and I, I did become an entrepreneur you know, throughout my career. And I, I was always enamored with agriculture, thinking that, you know, there's there's some advanced technologies that could be deployed in agriculture. And there weren't a lot of companies at the time doing it. Uh, you know, they were all, you know, this was, you know, the the dot com. If you look at the dot com companies and 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 then there were these companies that, you know, the Googles and the and the Facebook and the Twitters of the world. And and here, here agriculture was sitting alone and there was just a lack of technology in agriculture. So I, myself and a friend started a company called 640 Labs. And the whole concept is we're going to collect data off of farm machinery and put it up in the cloud. And we're going to do data analytics on it. And it turned out that was kind of a, a successful endeavor. 
you know, it was the company was only running for about 18 months. And then we got acquired by Monsanto and they put us underneath the climate corporation. Mm -hmm. And and it was uh, part of field view. But I started working with a lot of farmers and I, I had gotten, uh, you know, every farmer I worked with, they, they were telling me how what keeps them up at night labor. And it wasn't the it wasn't the cost of labor; it was the lack of labor. And how how are they going to continue to get qualified labor to help them? And you know, it's not that hard to think that autonomy is going to play a part in agriculture. So that was you know, I spent nights and nights thinking about that, about you know what autonomy is going to do with agriculture. And and I'll be honest with you, it's really not the technology in itself. I think. I think when autonomy is deployed at scale in agriculture, it's going to completely change the business. And, and, and it's not necessarily the technology, again, not the technology itself, but it's how, how the business is going to change with this new tool. And that's exactly what, uh, what was going through my mind every night when I was thinking about this. Hmm. So now you, you say you're kind of thinking about it. Okay. You know, a lot of different areas, agriculture. I mean, ironically, I, you know, I work in another industry that is, doesn't adopt a whole lot of technology, even though I'm an, a, a patent attorney, which is the legal industry and slow to, slow to adapt, slow to change, slow to think about it. And I, so I get a lot of that kind of echoing it back almost. So with a lot of the sentiment that I felt of, Hey, there's a good opportunity to, to tackle that and to approach it differently. So now you, kind of go through that experience, get to work with John Deere, work with the other business that gets acquired and and uh, kind of go down that route. Now, with all of that, walk us through, how did you get, because you started the business that you're now working on. You also got some funding, start doing some hiring. So how did you get to that point or how did you, or what, or what took you to the founding of this business? Okay. So it was uh, October of 2020 or uh, October of 2018. And I, you know, I, I was just obsessing about this and thinking about autonomy and agriculture. And, you know, I, th I thought to myself, you know, this is probably, uh, you know, uh, I thought, you know, if anyone can do this, it's me. And, and I thought long and hard about it. And I said, you know what, I, I made a goal for myself. And, and I did this just to kind of uh, make some waves in the industry. I'll be honest. It was at, at first it was I'm going to do this and I'm going to put everyone on notice, um, you know, that that this guy can go out and do this. And so what I did was I, I had decided that I'm going to go out in the spring of 2019 and I am going to deploy an autonomous planter and start autonomously planting throughout the throughout the country. And so what I did was out and I bought an 18 row 20 inch soybean planter and I went and leased the JCB 4220 a 220 horsepower tractor and I got a Peterbilt 389 I went and got a CDL because someone has to haul this and then spent the win winter developing this and on May 3rd of 2019 I deployed uh, the first uh, autonomous planter in the state of Iowa, in Sac City, Iowa. And, um, you know, so I spent the, the spring of 2019 and it was a wet spring, which which uh, helped me out too, because when it rains, you can't plant, <clears throat> excuse me. And then what I started to do was um, I, I started in Iowa, then I went to Nebraska, then I went up to Minnesota, then I went to Illinois and back down to Indiana. And, um, it was hard. I, I will say it, it was, uh, you know, it was frustrating. It absolutely was, you know, path planning was, was, was very rudimentary. Um, you know, there, there were a lot of issues with communications and, and then uh, uh, GNSS accuracy was an issue as well. Um, you know, it was, it was one problem after the next, but I wanted to get a feel for what it would, what it would take. And then meanwhile, what I, you know, given that, you know, I mentioned it was a very rainy season, um, I would get some, some days off because it was raining, you know, two, three inches and you're out for a week. So jump on a plane and head to California and go uh, get in front of VCs and convince them that this is a, 
this is a, a surefire uh, investment. And mm -hmm. so that helped. And lo and behold, I, I got a term sheet and, you know, I thought long and hard about this. I'm like, who, who am I going to get? What am I going to do? And so I went back to Chicago and I, I knew, um, I knew five people. Um, I had a list of five people that I knew that, you know, I could, I, I, they could help me pull this off. So I went back to Chicago, interviewed, uh, you know, these five people and brought them in and, uh, they were really the the foundation of the company, and and luckily all five of them are still with us today. Um, they're 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 in it for the long haul. Um, they're they're the leaders of the of my company right now. But it it all started with you know it was basically a dare to myself that I think I can do this, and and it just blossomed from there. No, oh, that's awesome. So you kind of. Hey, I'll, a little bit, I'll prove it to everybody else and, and probably disagree is I'll prove it to myself that this is actually can work and that it'll, you know, it will uh, be a, a viable business. And so you go out, get the equipment, prove it to yourself, prove it to others. Now, from there, were you able to get the funding, bring on team members, bring on clients, took off and what, or, or was wildly successful teetered on the verge of bankruptcy or kind of walk us through a little bit of once you kind of proved it out a bit, uh, where it went from there. Um, so after I, uh, after I hired these five guys, my, you know, the, the founding team, um, and myself, uh, we started looking at the issue from a broader perspective as to, you know, what we think the future is going to look like. And we have to, you know, we had to drive our development towards that, um, the first thing we did was, uh, in terms of customers, um, you know, it turns out, believe it or not, I was, I was a little hesitant about whether a farmer would let us plant their crops autonomously because it's, a, you know, it's one of the most important field operations throughout the entire growing season. Right. And, you know, it turns out for soybeans, they're, you know, they're, you know, they're more than happy to, to hand that over. Um, and it turns out that, you know, you could get paid per acre for that. So, you know, I looked at, well, here's an opportunity or, or way to monetize my R&D is go out and perform a field operation for farmers. And, and then what we did was we spent, you know, all of, you know, the majority of 2019 and 2020, um, developing the technology and, and I wish, you know, I wish you could, you know, I wish I could say that was, you know, most everything is off the shelf. There's just a lot of, there's a lot of peculiar, um, aspects in agriculture that make, that make the, the task of automating field operations extremely difficult. You know, the path planning, how you handle obstacles, the, differences in the field operations and how you know your path planner changes on field operations um you know communications was the most difficult um you know i wish i could say that the gps or our gnss receiver was uh you know there were there were some issues there it was just a lot of you know we spent two years developing the technology and meanwhile we were out there doing all sorts of different types of field operations. We went out, um, you know, we started planting, which was the hardest by, by far, but then, you know, we were out there doing uh, primary tillage. Um, we, we field cultivated, we planted, we were time weeding, we were cultivating, we were rotary hoeing, we were doing applications and we were, we were mowing as well. So we, we were really trying to get as much experience as we possibly can you know, being in the Midwest, there is a given window of field operations you can do. I mean, you we can't plant 24-7, um, 365, but, you know, we can, we can, you know, over the summer, we could uh, test out doing applications and mowing and, and cultivating as well. So it was, it was kind of interesting, the path that we went down, just performing field operations. And, and the, and the, the biggest advantage of doing that is, you know, we knew handing over an autonomous system to a farmer would not work because they're under a lot of time constraints. 
And if it doesn't work, they're just going to park it on the side of the of the field. And when we're responsible, and if you look over an 80 acre field, knowing that we have to plant this field, then the onus is on us to make it to make it work. And, you know, if we have bugs here and there or things don't work uh, according to this planned, then the onus is on us to make it work. And we're the poor, poor guys who are out there at midnight, you know, wondering why, you know, we're having issues with path planning or, or why we're losing communications. Hmm. So, again, the onus is on us to make it work. And that's that's one of the reasons why um, why we went out uh, performing field operations for farmers. No, that's awesome. So, and it uh, sounds like it was a, a, probably a bit of a, a learning curve or an iterative process and working out the technology and working out the arrangements and doing all of that. So, so now you kind of or get all that out, start doing it. Now, how long did you go out and kind of beta test it with farmers or did you bring a few on initially to prove it out or did you just go out and blitz the market or kind of how did you, how did you start out and grow that or, or bring people on? You know, <laughs> All right, so that's not as hard as you think. Um, you know, believe it or not, agriculture, I always say this, agriculture has two degrees of separation. I can get to any farmer through two contacts. And, uh, you know, we come across these, uh, these fairly progressive farmers. Well, to be honest with you, most farmers are very progressive. By their nature, they tinker. By their nature, they want to be the newest kid on the block with new technology, and they want to push the industry and and uh, adopt. They're very adopting of technology, believe it or not. And so I know a lot of farmers. I know a lot of people in the agriculture industry and, you know, calling, just making a couple calls, and, you know, and then you're sitting across the table from a farmer and you know, you tell them, I'm here, you know, I'm trying to fix your your labor problem and I'm trying to fix your capital expense problem. And nine, nine out of 10 would say, you have my undivided attention, go on. Hmm. Well, that's a, that's a pretty good uh, batting average or it sounds like you, you certainly, uh, you know, address the need uh, of people in the industry and uh, and leveraging that technology was uh, something that they were we're definitely looking for. Um, so now as, as we've kind of gone through a little bit of that founding, now walk us through kind of where, where things ended up today. So are you guys continuing bringing people on, continuing to grow and build the team and expand and are kind of as things tapered off to the uh, level where you're just maintaining it or looking to exit or looking to retire or what or kind of walk us through kind of or how the outlook looks. Um, so right now uh, we're at, I think, 36 people right now. Um, most of our software development has been being done in Itasca, Illinois, and then most of our equipment and our deployments and deployment team um, is based out of Ames, Iowa. Um, we are providing, we have a dealer network of 10 dealers right now scattered throughout the U.S., and what we're doing is we're starting to deploy autonomous systems into various um farming operations. Um, I'll give you an example. Um, modern Ag in Kansas, um, we've deployed some uh, some Kubota M5s into uh, some turf farms. And mm. every day, you know, practically every other day, they're deploying these, this turf farm is deploying these autonomous Kubotas to uh, mow their uh, entire operations right now. Mm. Um, we're, we're uh, you know, another one is we're down in Florida at Patrick Space Force Base. Um, the, there's uh, some airports or, you know, the, the flight, uh, their, their airfields, we're uh, currently mowing for them. Um, we're doing a lot of hay um, production. Um, just this last weekend, we deployed a system uh, for some farmers up in uh, Canada and they're doing wind rowing and uh, tetting and and we have a, a guy in Utah who's mowing with it. So we're we're right now we're hot and heavy deploying systems into farming operations. 
Oh, that's awesome. Sounds like uh, continuing to ongoing expansion and traction and, uh, and success. So that's a great place to be. So absolutely. Well, now as we've already gone through the founding journey, we're already reaching towards the end of the podcast. Feels like we just barely got to to hear everything, but so we'll have to have you on to the one of our sister podcasts in the future to to continue to learn about the growth and the expansion. But uh, at least for uh, today's episode, as we're uh, reaching uh, towards the end of the episode, I always like to to ask uh, one question. Um, so we'll jump to that now. Um, so within or that question would be is, <clears throat> so if you were to um, go back to the early days of your business, kind of just when you're getting started. There's always things that you can always look back, hindsight's 2020, things that you would uh, do differently today if you couldn't make those decisions. And so going back to the early days of the business, what would be the one decision decision you would make differently? I, I would vet potential partners a lot closer. Um, you, you know, we've, you know, I will say we've had a lot of, you know, I'll call them tire kickers, where, you know, these, these, these companies come to us and they want to vet us to see if there's, you know, a potential partnership or working arrangement. And, you know, one of the problem is, you know, as a startup, um, a founder in a startup, um, you have to have your eye on the, uh, you know, over the next six months, where we want to go, what we need to do. And, and I think it helps. It helps to vet any type of uh, partnerships or any type of uh, working relationships a little bit tougher from the get go, mm. because it could it could turn into a time suck. And and you know how large companies are, and they they they're very they're very slow moving. It's like a massive giant freight liner trying to trying to move them in the right direction. They don't mm. move as fast as you and. Um, I think from the get go, had I done things differently, I would have, um, I would have vetted them a little bit more closely in terms of, okay, you know, what is this partnership like? If we do this, then what? If we do this, then what? As opposed to, yeah, we'll do this. And then, you know, time goes on and then, you know, at a later date, okay, we did that now, now what? Well, let me see. And then, you know, and there's one week, then there's two weeks then there's a month. So it's, it could, it could, it could just be a time suck. So. Mm. No, I think that, you know, that's a, a great, it's, it's kind of one of those lessons that you learn along the way is how do I know if this is a good partner that, or how do I bet them? How do I qualify them? How do I, or, and in order to gain that, or once you gain that experience, it uh, expedites things, make things a lot better on both ends and uh, is a, uh, worthwhile and better on and yet early on it's a, an easy area that to uh, make or to make mistakes or to otherwise have a, a learning experience and so that's awesome so absolutely well now as we uh, wrap up the episode if people want to reach out to you they want to be a customer they want to be a client they want to be an employee they want to be an investor they want to be your next best friend any or all of the above what's the best way to reach out to you contact you find out more okay you can go to our website www.sabantoag.com or you can email me at rupinator at sabantoag.com. That's R-U-P-P-I-N-A-T-O-R at sabantoag.com. Awesome. Well, I definitely encourage people to reach out, make a new connection, support a great business. If nothing else, uh, make a new best friend. So with that, thank you again, Craig, for coming on the podcast. It's been fun. It's been a pleasure. Now for all of you that are listeners that are out there. Uh, if you can help us to share this, these founding journeys with even more startups and small businesses to help them along their journey into success, uh, just make sure to click share, subscribe, and leave us a review. Um, also, uh, or if uh, you ever need help along your journey with patents or trademarks or anything else with your startup, your small business, just go to strategymeeting.com, grab some time with us to chat, and we're always here to help. Well, thank you again, Craig, for coming on the podcast and wish the next leg of your journey even better than the last. All right. And thank you, Devin.